right. Welcome, everyone. This is episode three of the Angle Fantasy Basketball Podcast. I am the founder of Angle and your host, Andrew. I am joined today by my fellow Angle Fantasy Basketball analysts, Braxton and Mitchell. We are here today to discuss our recent Dynasty rank updates. We're going to discuss what we like and don't like about our own ranks and each other's ranks. Um, and also, we're going to discuss the uh, redraft leagues for Angle, too. But before we start, we just wanted to remind you that if you enjoy this podcast, as well as our videos and articles, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. We can be found on Twitter and YouTube at Angle Fantasy BB, and you can visit our blog for our weekly buy, sell articles and newsletter. If you haven't already, be sure to join our Discord channel. We have a help ticket system that allows users to ask for trade advice regarding their redraft or dynasty basketball team and get quick and reliable feedback from one of us Angle analysts. Also, we are just an awesome community to be a part of. So come join us fellow basketball enthusiasts and be sure to check the links in the description so that you can see all of our content as soon as it drops. Boys, we are here today for a new series that is within our podcast known as Rank Wars. So in Rank Wars today, we are going to discuss a player from each of each other's ranks where we disagree with where we have them ranked at. Um, we are also going to discuss um, a couple other things before we get started into the hot debate later on. <laughs> uh, but for star uh, for starters, we are going to go over the uh, the status and the current standings of our angle redraft leagues. Um, so before we do that, let's just get a little word from our other co-hosts today. Braxton, how's it going in the East Coast, buddy? It's it's going pretty good. It's getting a. Uh... Uh, it gets really dark really early here. So, um, you know, a bit depressing some days, but, uh, you know, other than that, generally really good. Uh, yeah, very excited to talk basketball with you guys. Very good. And rep in H town today, Mitch, how's it going, buddy? Pretty good, man. I worked from home. Life's good when you work from home. And <laughs> I just want to point out that we have a little theme going on today. We're all repping our favorite jerseys right now. So here I am with my Jalen Green jersey repping H Town, and then there's Andrew with his Fakers jersey repping. Whoa, LeBron. whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa! So for starters, I'm wearing the Legoat jersey right here for my LeBron James jersey. I used to have a lot more jerseys, but I've sold most of them. I know I've been kind of Laker heavy in our content recently, so I just want to let you know now I am not one of those Lakers fans who said we could trade uh, Russell and THT and second round picks for Kyrie Irving. That was not that me. <laughs> that would be your brother, though. That would, that be, would Phil. be Phil. <laughs> and we have Braxton repping the Devontae Graham jersey. Let's He's a go. Yes, it's, uh, Charlotte's version of a goat, almost. He is. Uh, he he uh, had quite the peak. In Charlotte, uh, unfortunately, he's rotting on the bench in San Antonio now, but yeah. uh, he'll always have a special place in my heart. Hey, so. he was the start of the rebuild, and he's pretty much what got he you was. Lamelo. So he was actually <laughs> he was yeah he held it down. What was he was he there for two years before you got Lamelo? Yeah, well, he sat he sat one um, you know almost a full year he sat, and then he kind of popped off for two seasons, uh, and then I if I'm remembering correctly, he was traded uh the draft before we got Lamelo, or he was became a free agent or something like that um it was like a signing trade with new orleans where they gave him that fat contract he's still on um they traded like a first round pick to be able to pay market value on him so uh, i'd say he did pretty well for himself and the hornets did pretty well for themselves as well yeah yeah you know i always feel like uh you grow attached to some of those, like the staple guys that were there during like the tank phase before your team actually makes it out and gets through the rebuild and starts to do well. So like for myself, that would be Contavious Caldwell Pope. He was there through all the tough times and then made it into the uh, to the championship roster as well, too, before I ended up uh, being involved in one of the worst trades in franchise history. Uh, when we got Russell Westbrook, when we took when we sent him away, that was a pretty good deal. But when we got him, that was one of the worst things that I've ever seen. But, uh, you know, I remember that day because Phil texted us in the group chat and he was like, oh my God, we just got Russell Westbrook. Yeah. <laughs> and then you were like, texting me on the side, like, dude, I hated this trade. We should have got Buddy Healed. And we should have got the ROI on it, though, else. was uh, pretty incredible. I'd say they, they ended up getting more for us than they traded away originally. So, potentially, you know, just yeah. Had to endure. Uh, that short period of time uh, where he was the hottest thing in basketball for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. Uh, set up pretty nicely now. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank goodness we dug ourselves out of that because it was rough. It was very, very rough there for a little bit. That the 2020, uh, that 2022 roster cost uh, Vogel his job. That was just a tough, oh, tough. Yeah, team I guess with some casualties. You're right. Yeah, yeah, that. yeah. That was a tough team. All right, but enough of the past. Let's start talking about our current redraft league. So. Um, for those of you who do not know, we run a few redraft leagues through the, our uh, server. Um, each of us are the commissioners of each of our three leagues. Each ones are a little different. We have one uh, standard draft redraft on uh, fan tracks. That was to allow for international participation. We have one on Yahoo, which is a United States only. Uh, that's also a, a standard uh, redraft. And then we also have a uh, third league that was done through an auction format draft. Um, so I'm going to start us off with the uh, Fantrex League. So what we're going to do for each league is we're going to name off the top six teams, give a shout out to each of those team owners. So current standings in the Angle Fantasy Redraft League on Fantrex. This is the International League. First place is going to be myself. And a close second place is going to be Mitchell, only a half a game behind me. Uh, we have yet to match up in this league. Third place, we got Weiss, only four games back out of first. Uh, Fourth place, we have Ignaz, five and a half games out of first place. Uh, fifth place, Gabe Puster Posey, 11 games out of first place. And in sixth place, Worth, the UAP markers, 11 and a half games out of place. Yo, shout out to Worth because in the power rankings, his team, I think, was second to last or pretty low down there. So shout out to our boy nine. for turning it around. Yeah, I mean, he's got himself in a good spot right now. He's two games ahead of the rest of the pack in regards to the playoff battle. So. Nicely done to our boy Worth. All right, Mitch, let's go ahead and hear. Can you, um, if you could see it on the screen here, let's hear a rundown of our uh, our Yahoo League. So first, comfortably is LGI till the day I die. He is one of my best friends from back home. He's first by four and a half games already, and We're he went with us to in... the South Bay game. <laughs> yes, yes. Shout out to Nam. Um, he has a pretty heavy lead. Then we have Richard's remarkable team. He is in second place by a good amount. And then there's a huge tier break from three to oh. eight where the game or the position and seating is only separated by three games. So there we have Andrew at third, fourth Chet GPT. I love that name. Shout out to Ralph. Five is Nam's burner. Nam is so hot, <laughs> AKA Weiss. And then six, me from uh, Angle. So Yep, that recaps our top six, and it's going to be a very competitive league. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, it is. Everybody is very close in that one. Uh, anything can happen for the rest of the season. Braxton, how are things going for you and your league over in the auction format? Uh, fun. Very competitive so far. Uh, you know, first place is uh, maximum categories, uh, kind of. Uh, uh, I do want to preface this one through five is, you know, neck and neck within like two and a half games of each other. Absolutely. So it's really all uh, semantics here this early, you know, the one through five. Number two is the quickster. That would be yours truly um, just kind of dominating my way into second place. Uh, if you can do such a thing, um, whole party, I, I want to give a shout out to, cause he's overcome the uh, fantasy, fantasy basketball cancer. That is Jordan Poole. <laughs> um, luckily he only bid, uh, $18 on him in the auction, but, uh, you know, some places he went a lot for a lot more and a lot earlier if it was a snake draft. Um, but you know, following that we got Colby's choice team, shout out Colby. He's only made seven transactions on the year, which is surprising. Uh, not a lot of streaming going on there. Shake and bake and Leroy Jenkins running out five and six with a honorable mention to Nick with. Uh, his Kings heavy team in seventh. Uh, one thing I do want to point out, um, you, you'll see uh, Justin's amazing team at the uh, in, in tenth <laughs> there. Uh, something that uh, had a lot of scrutiny earlier on in the season is that he bid a uh, $150 on, um, th this is free agent auction dollars on Kelly Oubre about four days into the season. Uh, and then he got hit by a car. Yeah. So it's <laughs> not, uh, that move is not, panned out well for him um as you can see he's only made three moves on the year with one of them being uh that Ubre. so um hopefully he can turn things around and uh, the dude's a magnet for players that get hurt man. 
<laughs> oh my goodness, man, that is that is quite a bit though. I mean, I know, um, like, what was what was the the budget in this league again? Is it two? Uh, two I I made it two hundred dollars waiver okay. budget. Um, the fun part is uh, nobody else put in a bid on Ubre, so uh, it was kind of just he was the lone um, bidder, and uh, really wanted to make him feel like he was welcome there. In uh, I guess there's no city, but in Justin's uh, amazing team, he's known for the uh, old and injured players, um, and he's got quite a few with Stephen Curry, Al Horford. John Morant, Kelly Oubre. So, you know, uh, hopefully it, what wishes and, uh, you know, sending good vibes his way. Uh, no hate there. Absolutely. Good. Shout out to Justin. We need, we need uh, every server needs yes. a person like him in there. Absolutely. Yes. All right. So that uh, recaps our redraft talk. So we will be uh, revisiting our redraft leagues a couple more times throughout the year, just to give you an update on how the top six shake out. And then, uh, you know, maybe we can get like a podcast dedicated to uh, once the playoffs go down, like what we're going to be looking forward to, how we're going to try to work things out streaming wise, uh, maybe, you know, talk, or maybe something talking about the trade deadline, too. But uh, we'll we'll talk about that behind the scenes. But now let's move into Dynasty. So for those of you um, who follow us, you know that we recently updated our Dynasty top 250. So in our Dynasty lists, we hope or we post a unique four column list. So on uh, the list, each column is the individual top 250 dynasty ranks for each individual analyst. So us three present here. And then the fourth list is the average of our three lists combined and averaged out. Uh, that's what the rank is for the fourth list. So the fourth list is basically our three minds combined, or um, you can see what our individual opinions are on our individual columns there. So for the um, update, we recently did that in um, November. Uh, the, the one previous to that was in August. So we let a good amount of the season go by to really see, number one, transactions. Obviously, quite a few happened. The Dame trade happened since then. The Harden trade happened since then. Um, and just, you know, breakouts as well as busts, too. Shout out to Jordan Poole. Um, so... What we're going to do first before we get into the rank war is we are each going to discuss a riser or faller or faller on each of our own lists. So this doesn't need to be the person who mathematically rose or fell the most of, in regards to rank on your list. This is just somebody you want to highlight who um, is in a new spot on their list and uh, what would be the reason for that. So first up, we got Braxton. Braxton, what, I want to, what we want to do here, or this is how we'll go. We'll have you name the player what their current uh, nine category stat set is, and then where you currently have them on your rank. Um, and then at least just like an estimate of how far of a shift that was from the previous rank. Uh, so uh, my player is Cam Thomas. Um, I believe, and apologies, I don't have it in front of me. Uh, Andrew, if you could scroll down a bit, I believe Cam Thomas is sitting at 101 on my on my list. Um, and this is kind of an interesting one, uh, because maybe 110 it was. 105? Yep. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so 105, and this is kind of an interesting one, because yes, while, while he did make a giant jump on my list, he's not really somebody I'm especially high on. I think mm -hmm. it was something like 100 spots he made the leap from, um, just because, you know, if Jacques Vaughn wasn't going to play him, he, he's, he's not going to be relevant, right? In, right? in the limited minutes we'd seen, previously from him you know he'll score score a bunch uh and the nets lose so uh you know this year he kind of popped off pretty early um something i am concerned about with him before and, I, and i've talked about this uh i think it was like my week three buy sell article before he got um injured was that you know there's really not a whole lot here besides the points right the the threes are under two a game i believe um no, it's a little bit over two now, 2.3, but uh, points right now, 26.1. But other than that, I mean, you're really not seeing a lot of supplemental stats. You've got 3.9 boards a game, 2.3 assists, which is fine, but not something you want to see from somebody who's getting as much usage as he is on this Nets team. Um, the steals is 0 0.7 and the blocks is 0 0.6, which will not stick. The blocks will go back down. Um, his field goal percentage is average at like 46 and the, the free throw uh percentage is uh 84 percent 
Um, that should say high and the volume there should be there. But my main concern uh, is that he's really not doing a ton for you outside of the points, right? Let's say he has an off night, scores 12 points. What else is there? There's nothing else there that is going to help you win your week. Um, and it's guys like that where it's really reliant on one category. And this has been talked about, you know, in fantasy for a while now. We're like blocks, for example. If somebody's really their their value is weighted heavily by blocks, if it goes down just a little bit, their rank also plummets with that, right? So, um, and you know, nine category rank can only mean so much as well, right? So, like if a player is ranked, I believe Cam is ranked, Cam's ranked 58 right now on the year. But if he's not doing anything besides um, you know, threes and points, how much is he actually helping you win your week, right? It's almost like a, a, a Tim Hardaway Jr. on steroids right now, where it's, you know, you're seeing these stat lines that look crazy and like, oh, wow, this guy's awesome. But, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I worry about um, any night where he doesn't put up 25 to 30 points is like, what is he doing for you? Yeah, and I think the, um, with Cam Thomas too, I think I would call him almost at this point coach reliant. Like, if something were to happen with Jacques Vaughn, I know, like, the Nets had a much rougher start to the season. I think they did start to turn it around a little bit now. Uh, but for the most part, if Jacques Vaughn ever does get let go, um, who's to say if the next coach is still going to pump, you know, 30 or whatever shots it is into Cam Thomas? He could decide to move on to... Uh, you know, try to move the offense through other people. So um, I will say Cam Thomas was definitely deserving to rise in rank amongst all of us. Um, you know, obviously we're not going to put him up in the top, like fully into the top, uh, you know, 75 or something like that, even though that's where his, like his Yahoo rank is right now. Dynasty wise, I don't know if we're going to fully buy into that yet. Um, so with that being said, Mitch, did you have any thoughts on Cam Thomas too? Well, I do want to say scoring is very hard to find in fantasy basketball leagues. And that's something to, to really consider when weighing down and uh, looking at an overall um, rankings list. Someone like Cam Thomas, who has given a little bit of an uptick in his assists. I think the last two weeks he's averaging around four assists right now. With the increased playmaking comes increased opportunity as well. So it's just something to really look into and kind of observe from an outside perspective. Uh, I believe all three of us don't really have any Cam Thomas stock. So we're trying to be as objective as possible. But I do want to say he did play a pretty big role into snapping the Orlando Magic's nine-game win streak as well. Him and Mikhail Bridges play really well, uh, and they really complement each other in terms of uh, the offensive load. Um, but we we never really know what's going to happen long-term from the Nets. They don't have their own draft pick this year, I believe. So they're kind of just trying to win games. And if they trust in him right now, there could be – prolonged opportunity beyond this season if we see can this continued progress sustain Absolutely. but i would I, wanna... I i, I right. do want to say like i still i am like you guys approaching this with caution something i want to add is that when kim thomas was injured you know you saw lonnie walker almost step into that exact role and put up some crazy stat lines in terms of points and and steals and things like that and you know he got zero hype in terms of a dynasty asset right so it's just like how much of it is and maybe i'm I'm going on the wrong path here but like i don't i just don't know i don't know how good cam thomas actually is and he's another guy by the way that his nine cat rank is going to be uh, a little bit inflated a little bit because his turnovers are really low and um not to discredit him for the low turnovers but if you're averaging 2.3 assists a game i would hope your turnovers are at 1.3 you know i wouldn't hope they were any higher than that otherwise it's like something terrible is going on here so yeah i i want to kind of hop in when you mentioned lonnie walker Uh, i think the key difference between the two players lonnie walker has been playing meaningful minutes on the spurs the previous two seasons i don't know if we remember but i think it was last year or the year before lonnie walker was a top 10 most improved player 
person award like coming into the season everyone was expecting that jump we've seen him in an increased workload throughout the whole season cam thomas's first two seasons we haven't seen him really play consistent minutes and this is the first time it's happening which is kind of a reason why he's garnering so much attention and excitement right now one thing i definitely do remember from last year is that when the nets would have people sit out um i know that well they, that roster's changed up so much but like when it was during a time last year like when Kyrie was still there and Kyrie was out cam thomas was known to come in and all of a sudden put up like 33 40 points or something like that on the games where nobody else was there and they had to resort to cam thomas so he's definitely always been capable of doing this he's shown this for a couple of seasons now i think he even had one or two explosives in his rookie year too uh, it's just more so it's actually managed to get to sustain minutes for himself. So I mentioned the where the Nets are at and the safety of uh, Jacques Vaughn's job. The I got the standings pulled up here. They are currently in ninth in the East at uh, 10 and 9. So they do have a winning record. And they're only a uh, half game back from a playoff spot. So, I mean, I would probably call uh, Jacques Vaughn's sa job safe for now. Um, but um, and as long as he's there, he's the one that's pumping, choosing to pump all these shots into Cam Thomas. So that's just something to keep monitoring moving forward. Um, it seems like it is real at this time. I feel like a lot of our rankings were a little bit cautious because he's still at like bottom 100s or mid 100s, something like that, or, or or potentially like the very low end of the top 100 for each of us. Um, so we didn't put him, you know, shove him up to 50 or 60 or 70 or something like that. But if he continues to keep doing this, then that could potentially be considered. But again, like Brax Benson or mentioned, um, it's very, very reliant upon his usage. Um, so that's Cam Thomas. Let's go into our next uh, player here. So this is going to be coming from Mitchell. Mitchell, who did you want to highlight today? Yeah, so I want to highlight Tyrese Maxey. And in my previous August rankings, he was listed at 61. I was a bit skeptical at first. Um, I didn't know. We didn't really know what the Harden situation looked like. Harden wasn't getting paid in the offseason, yada, yada, yada. In this updated rank, I put him at 28. And his current stats by this recording, he's averaging 27 points, 4.6 rebounds, 6.7 assists, 0.7 steals, and 0.8 blocks with 3.3 three-pointers made on an very efficient 46-90-40 shooting splits. Um, right now, he's currently ranked as the ninth overall player in nine category leagues. And some reasons for the rise in my rankings is because of the hardened departure. He's playing with the ball in his hands, but he's also have, keeping his turnovers very low even though he's increasing his uptick in assists. He's also maintained very efficient shooting efficiency along with that increased responsibility. So that's something that I guess I didn't really project moving forward from moving into this season. And Maxi has really surpassed my expectations. And also I want to do highlight, shout out to Nick Nurse, Nick Nurse is known to play his starters ridiculous amounts of minutes. Looking over the game logs of Tyrese Maxey, he's playing these low 40 minutes in every single game. If not the low 40s, it's very high 30s. Um, and also, he has an uptick in blocks. Uh, I'm not entirely, I don't really believe that he's going to continue average 0.8 blocks a game. Maxey is very athletic, but that's not a strong suit. Um Hopefully his steals raise a bit higher than 0.7. So if he does compensate for his steals and, and diminishing his blocks, why why can't he be a late first round player or early second round player moving forward? And I, I'm just really in love with Tyrese Maxey's game. And even then, in my December ranking, I might even push him inside the top 25. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I mean, I definitely, I definitely understand it. Like from my perspective too, number one, you know, I've always been a fan of Kentucky boys in general, and this is one of those, you know, the famous Kentucky guards. I think the rest of the world's starting to catch on to that now that a lot of the ones that they produce, except for um, only a mighty few. Yeah. <laughs> Ty Ty and the Harrison twins, majority of the ones they produce are end up being pretty dang good NBA players. And uh, you know, when we were talking about our redraft leagues earlier in regards to the Yahoo league, that's, or 
let's just say redraft in general, that's probably the, my most favorite uh, pick that I've had this year. I think I got him either round five or six, and he's, you know, he's got uh, top 10 value at this moment in time. So very, very exciting stuff uh, out of Tyrese Maxey. And then, you know, part of like the article I wrote with uh, um, for our newsletter, I mentioned how Maxey and Embiid are kind of replacing Jokic and Murray as the best duo in the NBA. Uh, I don't know about replacing, but actually just more so giving a rivalry in regards to the 2v2. It would be so cool to see this be a finals matchup between these two where they have the two-man game between their playmaking, you know, MVP center, and then their uh, their all-star point guard is part of that in regards to the two-man game. And then a lot, uh, the there's a lot of similarities between the two teams too, where there's just a lot of good cutting action and three-point shooting that's taking place around the two-man game of the respective all-star guard and MVP center. Uh, Brax, did you have anything to add in regards to Tyrese Maxey? Yeah, I, I, Mitch, I'm so glad you put Maxi as your as your biggest ri- riser because I mean, not to one up you, but I'm even higher on Maxi than than both of you guys have on your list. I got him at 22 on mine, um, and to be honest, in the next update we do, I think he's going to be even higher. There's no, there's really no reason he needs to be behind guys like Darius Garland or Desmond Bain. I mean, the best case scenario for guys like Garland or Bain, they're doing what Maxi is already doing. Right. Scoot Henderson is another one who I think I'm going to have Maxi jump above Scoot in my rankings because all, almost best case scenario, right, is Scoot is doing Scoot. If Scoot did what Maxi was doing, that's like best case scenario. So it's just he's, he's he, I'm so excited what he's doing. He's ranked number 11 overall in the year. Um, and I, I would assume a big part of that, the reason he's not down in the 20s is because his assist to turn, turnover ratio is so good. He's only averaging um 1.6 turnovers a game uh and that that blocks increase that you had mentioned Mitch is probably inflating him a little bit as well but you know I'm just I'm I'm so uh, there, I just think there's no reason he needs to I think the only reason he's below uh guys like Garland Bain uh Jamal Murray De'Aaron Fox in some cases is because you know we haven't fully accepted that what he's doing yet is is fully real just because he was down like in that 50 60 70 range last year and um, you know, a little bit lower than that the year before, but I think he's fully ascended to top 20, uh, maybe even 16, 17. Um, I could be talked into uh, on a dynasty list. I'm just, I, I love what he's doing. I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, and it, and B is the perfect person to put him against for his, fan, or next to uh, for his fantasy value. Yeah. Yeah. Tyrese Maxey has been such a darling, man. It, it's really insane. Just like last year, SGA was a league winner in Yahoo redraft leagues or redraft leagues in general, getting taken in the fifth, sixth round, Mm -hmm. same as Maxi. So whoever drafted Maxi this year, you are reaping the rewards. Absolutely. It's just crazy to see how much more fun that team is to watch after last year being one of the most unwatchable. I couldn't stand to watch Sixers games last year. It's uh, uh, crazy to see what happens when you get rid of the guy that's trying to pound the air out of the ball. (laughs) Um, all right, so let's move on to our next one. So um, we had a couple of risers for our first two. Uh, now we are going to do a faller, if that's a word. So for a fall in regards to uh, all three of our dynasty ranks, I have chosen to highlight Darius Garland. So Garland for myself, I believe he was in the top 25 for me in August, and now I have him at 35. And next update, I'm honestly considering um, you know, what I'm going to potentially do with him. But as of right now, Garland is averaging, uh, he's shooting 46% from the field. He's shooting 82% from the line. He is making 19 points per game, Uh, 4.3, excuse me, 4.3 rebounds, or sorry, 2.7 rebounds, 5.9 assists, 1.5 steals, uh, 0.3 blocks, and he is at 4.3 turnovers per game. So that's what the 4.3 was. So um, this is also on 1.6 three-pointers made per game. So the threes are down from last year. The free throw percentage is down, but that's kind of pretty slight. The points per game is down. Rebounds are the exact same. Assists are down. Steals are up. Um, and turnovers are up as well. So with Garland, uh, we were expecting, you know, for a lot of different lists that I've seen him on, he's in top 25, sometimes even in the top 20 on a lot of different lists. But if we're talking about him versus Trey Young, Anthony Davis, Paulo Bancaro is another one too, Jaron Jackson, Donovan Mitchell, 
um, Alperin Sangoon. You know, I myself would probably prefer Sangoon over Garland. So that's even more reason to keep Garland down where I have him in that 30 range there too. So with the struggles that he's having, it's also having an impact on the Cavs too, because they're not really having that great of a year as well. Um, so with Garland, part of what's just been happening is the, I mean, number one, the field goal percentage is similar, but the three pointers is the thing that's off. He was taking six per game last year, making 2.4. This year he's making uh, 1.6 per game while taking 4.8. So the three point percentage is down from 41% to 33%. The free throw percentage is still respectable, but the turnovers is what's hurting him in regards to a rank two. I believe he's still outside of the top 100 um, in regards to Yahoo. I know he's been dealing with some injuries too, uh, but did either one of you guys, you know, have any opinions on Garland and his recent drop in all of our rankings? Yeah, I, I I'll go first. So Garland, I I have been skeptical for a while after seeing him on many analyst lists. Not even Andrew in the top twenty five. I've seen him in the top fifteen, mm -hmm. especially updated up to this point in time. So why is there reason to believe he deserves to stay up there? Like Braxton was mentioning, I would have Tyrese Maxey over Garland in my next update. Someone like Desmond Bain, he's playing way better than Tyrese Ma uh, than Darius Garland right now. Bain has an uptick in assists while also averaging almost 25 points per game or 26 points per game while maintaining a higher efficiency. So these are some players that we need to target moving forward. And Darius Garland is a player that we need to avoid. If you are a Darius Garland owner right now, you know, use other analysts lists as a kind of a leverage point for you to sell Darius Garland as a top 15 asset. Maybe you can get someone like, like you're saying, Andrew Trey young or Tyrese Maxey. Maybe someone would even add to Tyrese Maxey. I don't know about now, but <laughs> These are some of the targets that you should look into when moving Darius Garland, because I do not believe that he is someone that can really expand his game any further until Donovan Mitchell leaves the Cleveland Cavaliers. But we don't want to play this game of speculation because it's burned us so many times. Hint, hint, Anyeka Nkongu, who we will be talking about later on in this podcast. And I'll just add to that. I mean, the, the, Andrew, you mentioned the turnovers at 4.3. I don't think they're going to stay that high. And I think the the three-pointers are probably going to creep a little bit closer to two. But um, if you have uh, Darius Garland um, and he's one of your top assets in the Dynasty League or you're viewing him as a high-end – I mean, don't get me wrong. He still is a high-end asset asset but I, I would be a little bit concerned I mean this feels like a De'Aaron Fox Tyrese Halliburton situation a little bit where you know you're, you might need to see uh, either Garland or Mitchell get traded or, or leave the free agency or something to, for Garland really to unlock his full potential because I mean Donna Mitchell just getting everything he wants on this Cavs team right now whereas Garland feels more like a floor guy um, instead of a ceiling guy on, on any given night I mean I just don't feel like the upside is is, is there um, and there is still upside there. Like I said, don't get me wrong, but you know, it doesn't feel like it's as high as you want it to be. I mean, how, like you want, you know, 22, 23 points a game and you want him to be able to go off for like 11, 12 assists any given night. It doesn't feel like he has that capability on, on this Cavs team, uh, with Donovan Mitchell healthy. Um, yeah, I just slight level of concern there for Darius Garland in terms of him being in the lead asset. All right. So. Those are the, uh, we had a couple of risers in Cam Thomas and Tyrese Maxey and a faller in Darius Garland. So that's discussing their movement on our own dynasty lists. So next up, we are going to discuss what we dislike about each other's dynasty lists. So this is where the rank wars begins. Now. <laughs> So for Rank Wars, what we're doing is each person is going to pick one player on each of the other Dynasty analyst lists where you find yourself disagreeing with their rank. So either you think that the rank is too low or too high. So you're going to uh, directly confront the analyst about this ranking, and then the accused will have a chance to defend themselves. Sorry, um, And then we will go on from there. So we're going to be covering six players in total here. So 
First off, to make his accusations, we're going to start with Mitchell. Mitchell, who do you want to go after first? So I'll just start with you, Andrew. I Let's see, do it. <laughs> I see you have Anyeka Nkongu at 61, and I believe he's a little bit too high. Uh, some key players that you have under him right uh oh yeah under him right now let's see brandon miller is one walker kessler is another and keegan murray yeah three back to back i would even consider jalen johnson and trey murphy over anyeka can you defend your take on okongu at 61 Shout out to a friend to Angle, friend to the podcast, Case, because uh, I saw him say one thing that I definitely agree with, that it, it is yet another year of us prematurely predicting Capella's decline and uh, Okongwu's rise. So um, I was definitely in that boat of people who want this Okongwu thing to happen so badly, but he still just always has this giant Swiss unit of a man and blocking his pathway to uh, to more minutes. So the stats for Okongwu right now, he doesn't hurt you efficiency-wise. He's shooting 57% from the field. He does shoot 85% from the line, and he is a center. Uh, 0.8 turnovers per game is actually a little high for a center, but we're not going to really pay too much attention to turnovers. He has been making threes. It's not a lot, but he's making 0.3 per game. 8.8 points, 6.6 rebounds, 1.4 assists, 0.5 steals, and 0.8 blocks. So one thing off the top of my head in defense of a Kongwu is I feel like this is an outlier in his stat set in regards to his blocks. His first two years, or his first years where he's been healthy, he has shown a propensity to average at least a little bit over one block per game. So that is something that I'm hoping to see increase. Uh, but in regards to the rest of it, especially when we're talking points and rebounds, you know, that's only going to happen if Capella gets moved away. So the reason why I have Kagu still up this high is because I believe people should still be, you know, those who really do believe in him should still be trying to hold on, um, waiting to see if the Hawks eventually do move Capella. Um, but, you know, it still has yet to happen. And like Mitch said earlier, this is a situation where, uh, speculation has burned us so i try not to speculate too much but this is this is a situation where i did um and at least this year in redraft and fan tracks that did come back to haunt me because i think i got him um in like the low 100s like 101 or 110 or something like that and he's you know either producing right at that level or a little bit below it so that's definitely something i could have done better than and you know if somebody wants to trade away a Kongu and manages to get a Brandon Miller or a Walker Kessler, or, you know, let's say you wanted to become like, you're trying to, to lean more into being competitive as opposed to focusing on youth. So you try to get, you know, Drew Holiday plus, Kawhi Leonard plus, you know, this is, this is dynasty we're talking here. Rudy Gobert plus is another possibility. So, um, you know, I don't blame people if they want to trade away a Kongu and try to build off the hype if there's other people in the league that believe in him. Uh, but that's the thing is you just got to find, <laughs> you got to find the believers because we, you know, it seems like he is going to do better once Capella is gone. But that's just, uh, you know, like I said, something that has yet to happen still. Any other thoughts on a Kongu boys? Um, I think I'm good, but I'm Brax. Are you ready for my next question? Yeah, let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. So, Brax, I am wondering why is Bam Adebayo ranked at 36 as a dynasty asset? Yeah, so not to be hyperbolic, but I, I think Bam Adebayo is the most overvalued player in fantasy basketball. You know, you see him drafted, and this is more of a redraft thing, but you see him drafted like at the end of the second round, early third round every single season. And, you know, I just don't think he, and I got the numbers to back it up here. We can go back at 21, uh, 2021, 22 season, he finished 41st. Um, he was 19, 10 and three assists. Uh, the steals were kind of high at about one and a half, but the blocks were under one. And he had zero three pointers to go with it. Uh, last year he finished 33rd, so an improvement. Uh, but you know, 29 and three, and the steals actually went down and again. No three pointer output from Bam. Um, and this year he's he's approved again, you know, he's at 26 on the year, but uh, you know, I, I the uh, the, the he's been banged up a little bit, right? Uh, Tyler Harrow has missed 
you know, a lot of the season so far. Um, he, his blocks are up a little bit to one per season or not per season, excuse me, on this season. Uh, and, you know, it, it could be real. He's done it before. He's averaged 1.3. I think it was in 2018, 2019. Um, but, you know, over the past couple of years, he's he kind of regressed in that aspect a little bit. Uh, again, he's not taking any threes. Something that's confusing to me in terms of where he fits in a build is like, okay, if he's not getting blocks as a big man, you'd want the threes to come in, but he's not making any threes, right? So it's like, oh, he's pump blocks, but he doesn't make any threes, so it doesn't help you in that aspect. Um, and I, I, something I think that uh, a lot of people are still clinging on to is that assist upside that he showed before uh, Kyle Lowry came into town. And he averaged over five assists, I think it was in – uh 2019 20 and uh 2021 um and ever since lowry and uh stopped in you know that assist has dropped back down to three you know and and he's this year he is at 3.9 so about four but again harrow is not playing jimmy butler's missed some time i think i think the assists are gone for good um and again he will not take three pointers he's like I, I just saw this stat the other day and apologies. I don't have it in front of me, but he takes like something like one of the highest percentage uh, percentage, the highest percentage of his shots are like mid range shots, like out of anybody in the league. So, you know, he's taking uh, what you'd call um, a, like a not low quality looks, but not the highest efficiency looks with the long twos. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I, I think he is, a, he's a tough fit in any build. Um, I don't know if he's going to get much better than this. I think he kind of caps out at that like 30 to 35 range. I don't think he has any kind of upset upside to, to finish any higher than that. And, you know, in turn, why would I rank him any higher than that? If I don't think he's going to get there. I mean, I've got him at 36. I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's going to finish above uh, 30. So this is got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, you, you make some really fair points in terms of uh, build, but I, when looking at Bam, I also think he does have some unique attributes about him. He is kind of like a mini Joel Embiid in a sense where he is a free throw anchor for someone who is a center. Uh, he is not a negative in assists. He is someone who has pretty high steal rate. So if you're building, you know, these are type of builds that I like when I build Dynasty, some high field goal. Um overall balance type guys, triple double threats on some nights. Um, so yeah, I, I, I find that a little bit interesting, but you do make some good points. Um, but it just confuses me a bit sometimes seeing someone like Mikel and Larry Markinen who are at the same age range, 10 spots higher, especially near the top of your list. I think it's just because I hate Bam's uh, stat skill set. You know, I, it's kind of it's kind of just like that weird what build does he fit in thing, right? You mean I mean the efficiency and steals are nice, right? But like, if somebody with low, a, a big with a low block rate like him, you want to stick in a pump, pump blocks. But if there's no threes there, I feel like you're, it's just wasted uh, value. Whereas you could maybe trade him for somebody that's going to help a lot more. Um, I I just think Lori and Mikhail both uh, well for Bridges, I will say the Iron Man status uh ascends him in my rankings more so than some other people just because you need that reliability whereas laurie i laurie has that top 10 upside i mean we saw it last year uh, i don't think bam can sniff that so that's why i have those two guys um that high uh and above bam i just i don't know i'm a, i guess i'm a class a bam hater i just <laughs> I, I had him one year in a redraft a couple of years ago and i swore never again because i would like every night i check my phone and be like what is this is terrible what does what this guy 20, 20 and 10 in a steal? Like this is, but like nothing else. It's just not, not for me. So. <laughs> I feel like you would like him more if he had the, the one block, one steal that he had in uh, like 2019 through 2021. Or if uh, he that... wanted to take a three, like if he yeah. wants to shoot a three, that would be nice. That could be helpful for his right. fantasy. That will skyrocket him to like 15 or something. Right. I mean, he if he's to. making one three a game, he's, he's, 
up there. He's like that mini Embiid you mentioned, right? Right now, I think that's a disgrace to Embiid. I think you're insulting Joel Embiid. <laughs> to even put Bam in the same conversation as him. I mean, we're not talking real life here. I think Bam can hold his own in real life, but, you know, it just, I don't know. He's just such a weird, there's not a lot of guys who are doing what he's doing in terms of his uh, skill set. And yeah, I mean, I've said it a times. I just think he's a weird fit in any build. So yeah, it, it is a weird fit. You'd have to build around him with players like Markel Fultz, those type of guys. Um, <laughs> shout out to my court team, which is that specific build that you hate. But <laughs> well, we won't go into that. So yeah. yeah, we'll go on to the next person. Yeah, with Bam. Well, actually, he is at one block, one steals. Uh, right now, I read his his uh stats in reverse that we have up on the screen here i was looking at his 17 18 so he is it is better at least with the the steals but uh you know obviously if the blocks were higher that'd be amazing because it's like you know if he is going to just be points rebounds and then somebody who also doesn't hurt you from the free throw line at the same time it's like you could potentially go for a different stat set around that range if we're talking redraft right now and then grab Jonas Valanciunas later on in the draft and almost get the same thing or Wendell Carter or something like that so you know he does a lot of good stuff and he does uh things well especially scoring and rebounding obviously chipping in a little bit of out of position assists too uh but there it, it would be better if there was some other areas that he was better in because obviously scoring and rebounding are the two stats that are the highest for all players, all players score and rebound. So those are the ones where, you know, it should be at a specific range. Whereas, you know, we covet assists, steals, blocks, and a high volume of threes. Those are the things we covet because they're harder to find. Um, and again, right. not to discredit him, he's not a bad fantasy asset, right? I just right. think he's in that upper echelon of guys. So he's definitely like in 30s, at least for me. Right. So. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So let's move on to yourself, Braxton. Who would you like to call out first? Yeah, Mitch, I got to start with your your Cade Cunningham at seven. I think even before the masterclass that he's put on this season, um, seven was a bit ridiculous for him. I just don't see that. And I, I realize dynasty rankings aren't reflective of how you think they'll finish in any given season. But I just think there's no way we see Cade, you know, finish at seven. He's He's obviously the efficiency can go up and the turnovers can go down, but this Pistons team is so bad. There's no way at some point they don't bring in somebody or somebody else steps up that takes some of that usage to me. Right. Yeah. So let's, let's take a quick deep dive into Cade. What really has kind of gave me an optimistic outlook on Cade is his last two weeks. So in his last two weeks, he was ranked the 30th ranked player in nine category leagues with averaging 25.5 points per game, 4.7, uh, I think, yeah, four four rebounds, 7.5 uh, assists, 1.5 steals, and 2.5 threes on 44, 97, and 44 shooting splits. Cade has been on an absolute tear at the three-point line. I know he had some inefficiencies his first two seasons. Even to start the year, he was shooting sub-30% at times. But looking back at Cade in the pre-draft process at Oklahoma, Cade averaged above 40% from three, which gives you that upside and optimism to really see Cade as a potential top 10 finisher moving forward. Cade also has an increased steal rate that we've seen in his freshman season. And he's also cutting down turnovers this last couple of weeks from 4.5 to 3.5. Like we were mentioning earlier, I think, Darius Garland, how he's averaging 4.5 turnovers right now. I don't see Cade averaging that uh, turnover rate moving forward. As as long as he's getting more help, um, he is going to be able to improve on his efficiencies. We've already seen it now when he's getting spacing from Boyan and Isaiah Liver, or Livers or whatever his name is. He's opening. They're opening up the floor for Cade on his drives. He, we're able to see that. I don't want to say Luca type of mid-range game because he doesn't create that type of separation, but Kate is evolving as a scorer and these are giving him good practice opportunities to essentially uh, become that number one option and franchise cornerstone moving forward. Um, and I know seven is on the higher side that I've seen him, but 
I, I like to reserve these triple double threats that are really well versed in my top 10. So we see someone like Jokic, Wimbanyama, Luka, Tyrese Halliburton. Tatum's not a triple double threat, but like you're saying about Mikel, Braxton, durability is the best ability. So we have to give it to Tatum. Devin Booker turning himself into some sort of assist god all of a sudden is kind of crazy too. Uh, LaMelo Ball. These are all, I guess, besides Chet, but Chet is his own type of unicorn in his own way. Uh, how are we going to put Kate outside of that compared to, let's say, Anthony Edwards' upside, right? We're never going to see those assist numbers. We're never going to see those shooting efficiencies from the free throw line that Kate has. As long as Kate jumps his field goal from about 41% to a respectable 45%, What's stopping him from being a top 15 asset for many years to come? Kate is only 22 years old. I get it. The Pistons are trash, but hopefully they pick up a top five pick who's a shooter, who spaces the floor for them so they don't have to rely on Isaiah Stewart as their second best shooter. You know, Boyan is coming back. I have a lot of optimism, and I think this is a really great buy low opportunity for Cade. Maybe he's not seven, I might push him back a little bit, maybe towards the back end of my top 10. But I think there's a lot to look forward to. And just to add to that, too, so I'll I'll, I'll chime in since I'm somebody who has Cade double the rank of you. So I actually have him at uh, 14. Um, so I f- chose names like, uh, you know, Embiid, Edwards, Lamelo, Chet, um, even De- Devin Booker and Scotty Barnes, which isn't looking as good now, but it you know for for myself i just felt like cade was having such a hard time because like sometimes with these teams when a team is bad you know usually the specific uh you know the high draft pick that they have is going to have like a very inefficient first season always too especially when they're on a very bad team like how paulo had uh when the magic were pretty bad last year um so paulo had a pretty uh inefficient season last year it's almost like Cade is reverting back to that again because he missed all of or majority of last year so it's like he had his rookie year which he also missed a little bit of time there too missed majority of last year uh, and now it's almost like he's like you know reverted back again so i would agree with mitch that there should still be optimism that he has room to figure it out um just because you know this isn't a guy who's played 200 games this is a guy who's played i I would assume less than 100 at this point i mean that's something we can probably try to look at too um but with Cade, you know he was just showing me some struggles where i would prefer somebody like lamella ball because at least when he's healthy he's shown to be a much better contributor and can actually you can actually see his name show up in the top 15 if we're top talking redraft um you know same at least now would go for somebody like chet um, you know, and I, and at least for the time being, I would assume Anthony Edwards is normally going to re- rank ahead of K or ahead of Cade in uh, redraft too. So, you know, he has room to turn around, but there is still a lot of work to be done. The Pistons don't make great draft picks. I mean, Cade was a good one, but he was also the obvious one. So the the best pick I'll give them credit for recently is probably got to be Osar Thompson. Other than that, their picks have been, you know, pretty struggling, and they even decided to give James Wiseman a second chance, which hasn't worked out super well either. So they got rid of more spacing in Bay in order to like bring in chance. less spacing. So, um, you know, with that, um, I don't know if I would necessarily trust Detroit to figure it out, but we'll, it's just something we'll keep an eye on for it. All right, so... Now we're moving on to uh, next one, Braxton. Who, who you're going after me next it would seem? Yeah, man. I, I I got some beef with you. I, I see you got Jared Allen at 76. I think it's I, it's just so disrespectful, man. I mean, <laughs> the, the past two seasons he's finished 33rd uh, in in nine cat rankings. He's 25 years old. I get he's next to Mobley, and I get he has one of the most boring uh you know stat skill sets um um that you can have i mean he's not going to put up any crazy numbers but he's like a rock solid guy he started off slow yeah he was on some restrictions coming off an ankle injury this year um uh he didn't play a ton of minutes early and he's currently uh at a career low in blocks at 1.1 um but some of that can be attributed to the low minute totals he was he was getting earlier in the season um, I, the part that I really have, uh, really upset about though, is that, uh, and this, 
it's kind of a, a callback to your Okongwu take is that you've got him 15 spots behind Onyeka Okongwu. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and <laughs> it's just, it's crazy to me. I mean, this, and then again, this, this kind of goes back into the maxi thing. It's like, what is best case scenario for Okongwu? And I, not to make this about Onyeka, but like, is best case scenario for him is like, a top 40 finish, right? Like with what Jared Allen has been doing the past couple seasons, he's only a couple years older than Okongwu. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me. And then having Allen almost down to 80 doesn't make any sense to me. I, I just, <laughs> unless his blocks fall completely off the cliff or he starts like thinking he needs to pass the ball a ton and starts turning the ball over a ton. I just don't, I just, I see no reason to have him down that far. I, right. I just want to say before Andrew rebuttals, I think it's because of his love for Evan Mobley. Okay, Andrew, back to you. <laughs> All right. Well, Mitch is right. I am also an Evan Mobley fan. So, you know, I I don't know. Part of me, for some reason, does seem to always gravitate towards big men, especially the ones that I, you know, really like to key in on and like a lot. You know, Okongwu, too, can call it local bias. He's from the area that I currently live in. He did go to USC. But, um, you know, I, this is a spot where, his his performance this season, um, as well as um, Capella still being there, is also is definitely having me second guess the spot that I have Ukongu in. And it's just like I said earlier. It's like if you believe in him, this is a range that he could potentially, or sorry, this is a range he could potentially finish at all the time in redraft if he has the log jam of Capella away from him. With Jared Allen, what you said in the beginning of your point, Brax, is yes, he does have kind of a boring stat set. But one thing that I will add to compliment Jared Allen is he's good trade value. So like myself, I traded him in a dynasty. I got, uh, it was like Bruce Brown, Bobby Portis, Terrence Mann, and I think something else for Allen and um, Max Christie. Um, so, you know, I that was something that completely turned my team around in that league to help me afford more depth. So people do rate Allen highly as they should right now I know you know Yahoo ranked shouldn't be the absolute law of the land that we follow he's outside of the top 100 at the moment so that's the point I'm gonna stop you right there I'm gonna stop you right there because Yahoo (laughs) uh, Yahoo ranked I said so I said it's not the best Yahoo rank is 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 totals right it doesn't factor in per game so somebody who misses you know Right. 10 15 games like him he's going to be outside the top 100 his real rank on the year is 60 even with rank with those career low blocks that i mentioned uh he's still you know 16 spots ahead of where you have him on the dynasty list he's 25 years old and like you said mobley i, I know you like mobley right but like it's just, <laughs> if we're thinking long-term dynasty i think jared allen is probably going to get traded and if he gets put like in, on a team where like I kind of compare him to Nick Claxton, but a lot better uh, in terms of obviously he's not he's not going to block as many shots, but the free throw is not going to kill you the way Claxton will. I, I I just I don't know I I just don't I don't get it, man. Even with the slow start this year, he's up to he's that high. I can't believe he pulled out Yahoo rank with the injury. That's crazy. Well, I said at the beginning that Yahoo ranks should always be taken with a grain of salt. So his totals, you are correct. His totals is in the 100s range. His average range or his average rank is, yes, near 60. Um, So the reason why I have him in this 70 spot range is because, I mean, for one, I probably should have him in front of older names like DeRozan, especially DeRozan. Actually, he's having a terrible year. He should be going down. Um, I should have him probably ahead of names like LeBron too, even though it just feels weird saying that out of my mouth in regards to their names, but that's not what you should be looking at. You should be looking at their dynasty value. So, you know, the only thing with him is that his his production is probably just going to stay exactly where it's at. There's not necessarily a ceiling for it to get higher. So it's more so this is exactly what you get with Allen. Whereas there could be potential plays for guys with, um, guys with higher ceilings that you can have instead of Allen. So like the dynasty trade I referred to, I didn't necessarily get any high ceiling guys. That was more for depth, but you can go through other options where if somebody would give you, like, let's say maybe you had to add a little bit to Allen to get Brandon Miller. Let's say you had to add a little bit to Allen to get Vassell or Simons, something like that. That's something I would consider potentially doing. So, you know, with Allen, like I said, Already in the beginning, he's very good. 
like value wise to get traded because he always does the same thing. He always has the reliable points, rebounds, blocks. His assists are or have been up. It was up last year too. And then I remember um, because I had him in Dynasty last year, he actually had uh, like pretty above average steals last year too. So, you know, definitely making some good points that I agree with. You know, Allen's rank should definitely be fixed on this um, coming into the next update. Uh, but more so the reason why he is where he is is because he usually does the same thing. And I wanted to um, try to make some plays on upside guys that could potentially end up higher than him, even though, um, you know, with Allen, you know exactly what you're going to get. So that's why he's good trade value because someone who values him knows exactly the type of player they're going to get if they do trade for Jared Allen. Does that mean I won the, uh, the battle here? Because you can see, <laughs> sure, yeah. yeah, I'll I'll concede on that one because he definitely right. definitely needs to get probably does need to get moved. So okay. uh, that's that's fair. That's fair enough. So now it's my turn, Braxton. Let's go ahead yeah. and turn it back around on you. This All is a right. man that I defend in any situation that I ever possibly get the chance to. Alperen Shengun at forty nine. So let me. Let me take a look at some names that are above him. Siakam for one. Josh Giddy. The one the craziest one to me is James Harden. If somebody ever <laughs> James Harden for my Sangoon, I would laugh so hard at him. Um, there's some Jalen Brown too is questionable to have above Sangoon. Uh Mitch has him 39, so a little bit higher, 10 spots higher. Hey, I am hey, I, I do I do want to take I do want to say. I, I wrote a nice column about Shingun that is going to be coming okay. out later this okay. week. Okay. <laughs> and I and I will mention, Andrew, I said that I will put Shingun up at least 10 spots because I am sold, especially with this three-point shot. So, okay, back to you. All right, now it's time to get Braxton to be sold. So at, at spot 49, there's definitely a large handful of names that I would pick from the, the, the list above him at 49 that I would rather... I would rather have Sengun than them. So Brax, you know, tell me, tell me your thoughts on Sengun, where you might consider him to be at in the next update, or if you don't want to move him at all. Yeah, you know, I in the previous one, I asked if I had won that one. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand the win right back to you. I, I <laughs> completely concede on this one. I, uh, I, I totally agree with your assessment. Um, you know, in the past couple of weeks, uh, I definitely have been sold on Sengun a lot more. I, I was really high on him last year. And then uh, for some reason, I just in my head, I was like, I, I thought his value had dropped a bit. Um, just like my personal opinion. I just didn't know if he was like a long-term piece. Um, just based on the fact that the Rockets were bringing in, you know, these vets. Oh, we don't trust him. Jack Landale got a lot of money. I thought that was going to be uh, eating into his minutes a little bit or maybe a sign they didn't trust him as much. And, you know, lo and behold, Jack Landale is not playing at all. Uh, you know, the, the only thing... I will say, well, actually, let me say first, uh, in my next update, he's definitely going to be um, at least uh, low 30s, maybe high 20s, something like that. I, I'm totally sold back on the bo back on board with him. Um, the only thing that I will say, and this is just like eye test stuff, he's got a tendency to miss defensive assignments. Um, his teammates seem to get frustrated with him at times for, for not rotating correctly. Jabari Smith has like, I don't know if Jabari Smith just doesn't like him or what. He seems to yell at uh Shangun all of the time for the Rock <laughs> in the Rockets game I've watched. I don't know. I don't know if it's like a, there's some kind of weird chemistry thing going on there, but uh that is not concerning. But you know, maybe if they get somebody else on the team, I, you know, remember we, they talked about getting Brooke, Lo Brooke Lopez in the in the offseason. Right. Um, you know, maybe if they get another big that can challenge Shangun for minutes, that could be kind of concerning because uh, of his defensive, uh, not lapses, but just, you know, he, he's not making all the right plays yet. And another thing is, uh, it seems like he just, <laughs> he won't stop shooting, right? Like, you know, I just watched the Lakers game the other night and uh, he took something, I think it was like eight for 27 or something. And it seemed like, and this is only a one game sample size. There's, you know, there's other games where he's taking tons of shots, but it seemed like even though he was missing shots, he would just drive in and just put it up every possession even though he was missing every single time. So um, it, in terms of fantasy value, that's something I could be a little bit concerned with where he just, you know, in his head, he isn't, he's taking as many shots as he can. Um, but yeah, other than that, I'm, I'm totally sold. I, I, he's definitely going to be, be making a big jump uh, on my next list. And 
uh, yeah, I definitely concede that one to you. I, that was uh, not a mistake, but uh, maybe I, I should have more faith in him. It's funny because I like vividly recall, you know, going back to Jared Allen, I vividly recall like playing with his spot on the list and just like having it in my mind, like this is probably too low. I don't know why I have him this low. <laughs> so it's kind of just something that happens as we as we learn and go in regards to dynasty ranks. So, you know, and that's this is what uh, this is what rank wars is for. So time for my next debate topic. And this is the reason for the Rockets screen and Rockets jersey. Mitchell. Now, to set a little context, <laughs> uh, I do. I am quite an aggressor towards Mitchell on almost a weekly basis in regards to this exact player. So the player <laughs> in question is Jalen Green, which Mitchell, I think 54 is too high. You have him ranked above the likes of Vassell, Mark Williams. Uh, at this point, I would probably prefer Green over Giddy. You have him over Fred Van Vliet. Um, you know, just a few a few names. Uh, even Anthony Simons is another one there. Nick Paxton is another one too. So, Mitchell, give me your defense of your man, M. Jalen. Yeah, I mean, where where else are you gonna find twenty five five and five potential, man? I I'm just gonna be frank, <laughs> and, and I I do want to say Nick Claxton. Okay. You look into rookie drafts, there's always going to be players like Nick's Claxton that you can draft in the mid-teens. When are you ever going to find the opportunity to buy a young stud who's 21 years of age, right? Who has the capability of averaging 25, 5, and 5. We've seen recent flashes from Jalen Green in these last two weeks and in the last month. I, I do want to point out, too, who... Okay, Andrew, let me ask you this. Who was the Rockets coach the last two years? <laughs> uh, Dr. Death himself, uh, Stephen Silas. Yes, <laughs> Dr. Stephen, Stephen Silas, the one renowned for his AAU style playbook, right? Jalen Green is finally being coached with an NBA caliber coach. Like, we're essentially rehashing his whole rookie season right now. Right. He's he came into this league unpolished. He is an athletic, springy, electric finisher who has crazy shot making potential from the three point line. He's a three level scorer. Um, he's not someone like Shangun who's already going to excel, who had these accolades playing in professional ball overseas. Jalen Green is is just someone that you have to buy into. You have to see it for yourself. For one, I went to this rockets game over this past sunday probably the worst game of jalen green's career he had 10.7 rebounds and six turnovers but he's working through these struggles coach imi adoka is holding him accountable sometimes he's benching jalen green for the entirety of the fourth quarter and the next two games he's at, he's scoring 25 30 points he's answering um from all the backlash, you know? So I, I just want to be very, very patient with Jalen right now. And are you really telling me you'd rather have someone like Nick Claxton that you can draft in the mid mid teens, early twenties? Well, let's, let's talk, let's talk about this. So you, you brought up accolades that Sengun came in with more of the European pedigree. Jalen green was the number two pick. Sengun wasn't even a lottery pick. So if we're going to talk about accolades, obviously the spotlight, the hype was on Jalen green. Like I said, this is also one of the first, uh, well, not one of the first, but he was, you know, kind of part of that new wave of guys coming in from the G League Ignite program. I think there was a couple of draft classes before him that had Ignite players, but the Ignite itself is still relatively new. So Green came in with more hype. Sengun was not even a lottery pick, and he was traded on the day of the draft, too. So that's number one. If, like you mentioned, too, we've seen flashes from Jalen, but we've also seen regression, too. He's actually regressed from last season. So rookie season to sophomore season, he got better, which he should have. Uh, but this year he has regressed. So part of that goes into what you mentioned with, you know, the coaching change. Silas is gone and, and Udoka is in. Udoka is doing a better job, but what he's doing as a better job is what Silas should have done too, which is to let the offense run through Sangoon. So <laughs> at least, the, you know, that's why you know Ime's doing a good job is because he's let 
you know, that's who he's got the offense running through. So that's just kind of what I don't like about Jalen. He seems to be sometimes have a little bit of a chucker vibe to me. Also, the below 80% on free throws is always something that kind of bewilders me, especially because he does get to the line um, at least this year five times a game. So that can potentially hurt you if you're in a high free throws battle and you need to maintain 83, 85% or something like that, then he could potentially hurt you there too. So, you know, just a little bit of regression coming out from Jalen. Yes, he probably is playing better winning basketball. I could probably agree with that. But for your fantasy team, you know, obviously better real life, but for fantasy, you know, it looks like he's uh, he's regressing a little bit. At least the counting or at least the rebounding has gotten a little bit better. But uh, that's just someone where I have questions over um you know over what he can grow into especially with supporting stats whereas you mentioned at the beginning of the show um you know points rebounds are usually categories that could be easy to find high point scores are not easy to find which that can be Jalen uh but he's actually regressed in his points too so if he's going to regress in points not offer up much defense that's where somebody like Anix Claxton could be preferred in the correct punt because he's going to offer you know, let's say the needed high field goals and blocks where he's a specialist in one area. And that's what actually helps out with his rankings too. Whereas Jalen is a specialist in an area that could potentially be easy to find on the wire. And he's not exactly very good at anything else besides what he does. And he has inefficiencies in regards to what he's the best at too. So that's kind of my gripe on Jalen. Brax, did you have anything on uh, Jalen? Yeah, I'm going to pile on a little bit. I think Jalen Green is a bona fide chucker. I, you know, I, I just don't – I have a hard time believing that for the Rockets to get better or, or the Rockets um, are, are patient enough to let Jalen Green uh, kind of max out this hypothetical potential of a 25-5-5. and five. I mean, we saw them bring in the vets this year and Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, who are both very high usage, who, don't get me wrong, are also both chuckers. But, you know, I, I just – I have a, I really think they'll they'll bring in somebody else who might eat into that usage a little bit to kind of prevent him from reaching that hypothetical ceiling. Um, the, the the steals and blocks are not there. They haven't been there his his in his career yet to this point. That's something he's going to need to improve on on for his fantasy value. Um, the field goal percentage obviously is something that can improve and can very easily improve. But I just have a hard time um, seeing him get anywhere near 50 it, uh, it, on, on any given season at any point in his career. It's almost, and I'm not comparing him to R.J. Barrett, but we know how bad and harmful R.J. Barrett can be to your fantasy team, just regardless of how impactful he is in real life. You know, he, I, just, I, I just don't think Green gets anywhere near um 50 i think maybe he tops out at like 75 in terms of uh end of season finish um and for that reason i wouldn't have him at and i, and I have him in the 60s in my list too Mitch. don't get me wrong i don't have him down by 90 or anything i, I think there is uh the potential for him to be you know not maybe not a number one guy but a really solid number two Jalen brown-esque type guy but uh, you know i just don't I, I i don't agree with your uh assessment either i I think it's way too optimistic and uh the rockets are still bad so um someone's gonna have to change they had yeah a good start. I, I i just want to say like let's revisit this after two seasons just because we are oh learning it's already and... after two seasons no i know i know i mean that was part of six that was part of my six, point he's gonna be crazy yeah year six he's gonna be wild <laughs> That this was part of my point, right? Like, okay, he, okay. he was playing under Steven Silas. Let's wait and t- wait and see until he has some real development and a real coaching staff. But Andrew, before we end, I want to see where you have Jalen Green. Would you really take all these ninety-five players above him, or are you just kind of, I don't know, a little biased towards some of the players I personally enjoy? Well, I should have, I should have said. Because like in the beginning, when I started my accusation, I did add in that I basically bully you about Jalen Green. (laughs) And what I meant to also say during that is I probably have him too low myself. So this is something that should be adjusted. Uh, Not that high, but like names like PJ Washington, Jalen Green should be above him. Um, you know, there's a, there's definitely names on here that Jalen Green should be above. So I did need to add that in. I forgot to that. 
<laughs> on my own list. Um, he should probably be a bit lower. I don't know if I was thinking maybe I just wanted to counteract where you have him at. So the average list looked better with where he was. <laughs> Um, something like that, because he aver he ended up at seventy three on the average, which is probably where sh he should be at. So maybe maybe that ended up working out well. But uh, yes, you do have the right I'll, to call me out on where I have him. I, I want to jump in real quick, and I'll defend you a little bit, Andrew. I, I think there's uh, kind of a fun thought experiment is uh, when it comes to these lists. It's it's what is perceived value versus uh, you know where what what they can actually do in terms of fantasy output, right? I, I don't think, you know, for example, somebody who's a little bit older on your list, uh, Andrew, like, uh, I don't know, what's a good example here? Like Michael Drew Porter Hardy. Jr., who had an 82. Michael Porter is a pretty good nine-cat guy, um, but he doesn't have a ton of perceived value at this point just because he's kind of topped out at where he is. Uh, even though even though I don't think Jalen Green is going to get anywhere near 50 on, at the end of the season, he still needs to be in the 60s in, in, in my rankings because when it comes to like talking trades with people and and uh you know just generally you know, you know value of an asset in a dynasty league, he probably is in that 60, 70 range, regardless of how much he's actually helping you. So I guess in my head, he's more of somebody I would always trade at his perceived value than keep. Um, that's kind of why I have him where I have him. Uh I will say, Andrew, I do think you have him a little bit too low, but uh mitch i think you have him way too high i agree with you that's probably why i should raise him is because of his perceived trade value he has way better trade value than a 90s ranked player i do agree that's probably the strongest point for to be made for me to rate to raise him up on the next update then right and and at the end of the day these dynasty lists are perceived value from not only ourselves but in terms of trades with our community members or our league mates so great point um but yeah i i love how braxton you were able to mediate this uh rank war or debate on jalen green and it it gives a lot of perspective won. so i think either one i think it was a i think it was a dead even tie on that one <laughs> yeah you you were the middleman there for sure so <laughs> appreciate it appreciate it well all right then well boys this has been a successful first edition of rank war so this is something we plan to do in regards to our podcast whenever we have uh whenever you see a uh, dynasty rank come up from us you can expect to see a rank war podcast happen a couple of weeks or so after the ranking update happens so uh we should be seeing another one coming up probably sometime uh, later on this winter in regards to a rank update and you will see a rank war to follow that before we leave today, Brax or Mitchell, is there anything else you guys would like to add? Brax, you can go first. Okay. Uh, I, I would just like to add, please stay away from Jalen Green in redraft leagues. Um, he's going <laughs> to hurt your season. He's going to tank several categories for you. Yeah. Do not, he's not a redraft asset. <laughs> stay away, please. Yeah. Um, I'd have to agree with that. Ooh. This Jalen Green is a long-term hold, and you do not see him in any of my redraft leagues. And when I'm, yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll let you have that win right there. Um, moving forward, we want to implement something in our next show. Andrew, uh, would you like to introduce the mailbag series? Yes, that is great. Thank you for bringing that up. So for those of you listening right now, those of you that are in our server, the next podcast that we plan to do is going to be a mailbag episode. So what we want you guys to be on the lookout for is both on Twitter. Uh, it's going to happen on Discord first for server members. They're going to get priority. And then this will come out on Twitter a little bit later. We're going to open up links for you to ask us questions in either redraft or dynasty uh, basketball related matters. So the one thing I will say to you out there is that if you are a point Points League player, please be sure to specify that you're asking about points or else we're going to assume that you're talking about nine category. Uh, but we, you guys will soon see um, an area set up where you can uh, ask us your questions and then you're going to see us uh, go over those questions on the next podcast episode, which will be our mailbag episode. So uh, for everybody here at Angle Fantasy Sports, on behalf of myself, uh, Mitchell and Braxton, we want to thank you all for joining us today. Again, check the link in the description or this descriptions down below uh, at Angle Fantasy BB for YouTube and Twitter. Uh, you can catch us on Spotify and Apple Music for audio uh, podcast platforms. Uh, you can catch our blog for our weekly buy sell. 
and our uh, newsletter. Uh, and check us out on Twitter, too, like I mentioned. Uh, thank you, everybody, for stopping by today. We hope you all have a good one. See ya. Thank you.